Are you ready? Yes. Okay, we're back. You know, we test out everything ahead of time, and sometimes the best laid plans just don't work out, but we're back here. So I'm going to pick up where uh, we had left off. And uh, so Remo say, Re Remog says, say fuel uh, regulations are given to the states, how will automakers respond? And I think what he's getting at is, you know, California and about 12 other states are threatening to just set their own regulations and go apart from uh, the rest of the country. Uh, and they might be able to do that. It would be a massive headache for the automotive industry because having to build two different sets of cars for different parts of the country is going to be a logistic nightmare. Not so much in the assembly plants, that'll be a big headache, but once they get out into the yard and start getting shipped across the country, ooh, it's, it's going to be a disaster. And the reason that they would not just commonize on the California regs is those cars are going to be substantially more expensive. So, it, and then you've got the problem of people in the those other 12 states plus California who live near another state where prices are cheaper, they're just going to drive across the state line and buy their car there. So mega headache that the auto industry does not want to see happen. Very good question there. Uh, Joe uh, Laszlo uh, wrote in to say he pays $200 annually in G Georgia for his electric car. So again, that's how states are going to get it. Uh, Frost says some states are going after title and registration. Other states are subsidizing them, uh, like New York State. Uh, NC says selling higher gas tax is all about marketing. Boy, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm not so sure about that. I wrote articles for years. And I'm not the only one. A lot of people wrote articles saying we need a higher gas tax. It's, I don't think it's better education. People just do not like paying more money at the pump. I mean, it affects their wallet every time they go to the gas station. And, uh, and especially for people uh, with lower incomes, boy, the, the pain is immediate. So that's why they're doing it. Uh, Scott C says, uh, is GM going to build a body on frame SUV like the forerunner in the US? Maybe another trailblazer or blazer? Uh, yeah, they are coming out with the trailblazer again. Uh, Blazers is, is coming back. Uh, they've got to counter what Ford is doing with the, the new Bronco that's coming out. Will it be body on frame? I don't know. But remember, uh, the, the Cadillac Escalade, the, the Chevy Suburban, uh, the Tahoe, all, those are all body on frame. So if you're asking if GM will buy build one, they already do. But I, I think maybe you're asking about a smaller one. We'll have to see which way that goes. Uh, he also wants to know, is Cadillac working on a SUV based on the Traverse Acadia Enclave platform? Yeah, you bet it is. Cadillac needs a whole bunch of crossovers in its lineup right now. That's what it's really looking for. Okay, Bruno Tata says, on one hand, they're doling out tax credits for $100,000 Teslas. Then the state goes and charges someone with a small EV. Well, look, I mean, you know, the, the states aren't just going to give away uh, er everything for free. Uh, and they've got to have some sort of road tax. So, yeah, no, th that's a pretty good point that they will subsidize somebody buying an EV and then charge them more uh, for their title on it. Robert Berg wants to know, the, the gas tax has always felt like a hidden tax. We all know it's there, but I don't think very many, including myself, actually know how much tax is included in each gallon of gas. Yeah, most people don't know that. Uh, I want to say on the federal level, it's like around 18 cents a gallon, and it's a little bit more for diesel, 21, 22 cents, something like that. And then states add on uh, their own taxes on top of that. So probably on average, I'm going to estimate all, all baked in, you're probably looking at 40 to 50 cents a gallon is just pure tax, but it depends on the state. Joe Laszlo says, from the previous chat, since GM is basically out of Europe, can they ignore the Euro pedestrian crash standards that cause flat front designs? Well, they're not completely out of Europe. Remember, they're still selling uh, cars like the, the Corvette and the Camaro. They're still selling full-size SUVs over there. So even though you're right, they've mostly gotten out of the mass market for Europe. All the other cars that they're sending over there have to meet European standards for safety and emissions. Let's see. Lexus Fan 100 says, is there a new Phaeton coming to the U.S.? 
Uh, I see it's coming to China. Yeah, there is a new Phaeton coming. The Chinese one's going to be purely electric. I don't know if that's uh, Volkswagen's plans to bring that to the U.S. market. My guess is not because it's going to be pretty expensive. And the Phaeton was a total sales flop first time around. But in China, with all the regulations there for electric cars, it makes sense. So thanks for the question. I guess I didn't really give you an answer about whether or not it's coming to the U.S. market, because obviously I don't know. Uh, I think I should just call you a 3R3D to make it easy on myself. He asks, I'm curious if Ford considers the Taurus SHO as part of the Ford Performance brand. I never see it advertised as being part of it, yet supposedly it is a performance car from Ford. Uh, yeah, I think Ford considers it part of the performance brand, but as you know, that's all going away. In the next year or two, the, uh, the Taurus is going to be gone along with the show. So you're not going to see any advertising about that car now, if there ever was any in the, the first place. When a car gets on the chopping block, you stop advertising anything about it. Uh, Scott C. says, you better buy a show now before they're gone. And boy, he's right. Nathan Berliner says, I really enjoy seeing the racing updates on the Daily Show, but what happened? Barn finds. Uh, thanks for your uh, appreciation of us updating uh, the racing results. Uh, we haven't had any good barn find photos uh, come across our transom anytime recently, whether it's us finding something out there or whether you, the viewer, sending things in. So if you've got an interesting photo of anything, anything automotive related, send it in. If we like it, we'll put it on the show. Uh, Joe Laszlo back. Any hope of Ford keeping a performance sub-brand to keep bringing performance cars not named Mustang? Not in the U.S. market. In Europe and elsewhere, absolutely. But not in the U.S. market. The cars are just going away, unfortunately. Lyle Pruitt says, due to cheaper passenger cars disappearing, will there be a price point where millennials will decide not to buy a vehicle and enjoy leasing or renting options? Uh, well, look, just because Ford's getting out of passenger cars for the most part doesn't mean that it's not going to have entry-level crossovers. I mean, right now, the only thing in their lineup that uh, even approaches being entry level is the Echo Sport, which goes for about 20 grand. I got to believe they're looking at something less than that. And just because Ford's getting out of that doesn't mean other car companies are going to follow what Ford's doing. So, yeah, there, there'll be plenty of entry level cars for millennials to choose from. But guess what? More and more people are choosing late model used cars, especially certified pre owned where you can get a car that's two or three years old that's already depreciated 30%. So you're getting an almost new car for 30% cheaper than what it would be new, and you can get a year's warranty on it, and that's increasingly what people are doing. Chris Mann back saying, any word on anything from the new GM twin half tons? Can't wait for the diesel numbers. Uh, no, nothing new on them yet. Look, they're they're still fairly new in the marketplace. Uh, I, I believe we're still a couple of years away before that uh, we see anything new with them happening. Let's see. What do we have here? Alexis Fan 100 is asked, what do you think of these car leasing programs like Volvo, BMW, et cetera, where you pay one fee for a month? Uh, do you think those prices are high or is it a good deal? Uh, and what he's talking about is what, uh, the industry is now calling subscription prices. So instead of buying a car, instead of leasing a car, you get a subscription service that includes everything. Your insurance is, uh, is baked into that. All your maintenance is baked into that. Uh, the only thing that you have to pay for is the fuel. So whether it's gas or plugging in or electric, and depending on what the car is, uh, People like this. Is it a better bargain? Of course not. This is not some gift to the consumer. And we saw the same thing with leasing. All the car companies are trying to do is figure out some other way to sell what they've got. And some people don't like committing to a lease for three years. They want a subscription service like their phone where they can walk away after a year or two. And for some people, that's going to be a nice way of getting a car. But is it a cheaper way of getting a car? 
I'm sure if you do the math, you're going to find out it's no cheaper whatsoever. In fact, it might even be a little bit more expensive because you're paying for the convenience of being able to walk away. Having said that, I think we're going to see a lot more coming with subscription services, including subscription services for used cars. NC says, what happened to talking about the need for a higher gas tax? You missed the first part of the show after we had a technical glitch, but uh, I already talked about it there and it'll be uh, up on YouTube, I'm pretty sure. Dave Sullivan says, hi, John. <laughs> Dave, how you doing? Always good to have the analyst community uh, tuning in here. Scott C says, speaking of finding stuff, my local PBS station sucks. I can't watch AutoLine on my local PBS station, KLVX, but it's okay. I rather watch you on my phone. Or I got a great suggestion, Scott. Send a very polite letter to KLVX and say, hey, there's this terrific program that people all over the country watch. It's called AutoLine This Week, and I would love to see you follow in the suit of other public television stations and carry it too. And in the meantime, you can watch us on your phone. Joe Laszlo says, Porsche for 2000, he's talking about subscription services. Porsche for $2,000 a month is a relatively good deal. And what he's talking about and why he's saying $2,000 a month is a pretty good deal is with this subscription service, you can call ahead and say, hey, I don't want to drive a 911 this week. I want to get a Cayenne or I want to get, you know, a fill in the blank. You can get into whatever Porsche you want, pretty much whenever you want. And uh, that's why he's saying $2,000 a month is a pretty good deal. This is still a pilot program. Porsche is experimenting with it. Volvo is doing the same thing. Cadillac is the one that kicked it off. I think BMW just announced a program too. But like I said before, you're going to see a lot going on with these subscription services. Scott C says, okay, we'll do that. Thanks, John. Okay, yeah, write those letters. Remog says, Many automakers announce that their future lineup will be electrified. If they're a hybrid of some sort, can we drop the hybrid badge and its associated culture? Good point. You know, Remag, I, I, I've been saying I don't think the public wants hybrids. You know, we've had hybrids for almost 20 years. There's 30 different models I'm talking about in the U.S. market. You can get small ones and big ones and crossovers and passenger cars. There's even a mild hybrid pickup truck. And yet they're still 2% of the market. So the market has spoken cl clearly and loudly. It doesn't want hybrids. So you got to sort of just electrify the powertrain. Don't even tell people that they're getting it. And I think that's how they're going to catch on. NC says, do you see car sharing subscription on EV AVs, autonomous vehicles that give us a use for so many hours a month? It, yeah, a great question, NC. I think we're headed towards a future where more and more consumers are going to buy miles instead of buying cars. And there'll be different price points, you know, so you'll have the El Cheapo version that you'll be able to get a car whenever you want, but who knows what it's going to be. It may not be the cleanest thing. You may even have to share a ride, but it will be the cheapest. And then we're going to go up to the very top end where you're going to pay more money, but you'll get picked up in a high-end car, it will always be pristine. You won't have to share it with anybody else. It'll be your service. But that's where I see this industry going. Not wholesale. I don't think, you know, vehicle ownership is going to go away. But as long as being able to buy your miles turns out to be cheaper than buying a car, I think a lot of people are going to go for that. Uh, Joey's cleaning lady. <laughs> Now, there's a title I love, a name I love. He says, electric cars pay no gas taxes. The road taxes will soon be collected based on where you drive via mobile tracking devices that will be mandated on cars. You could be right. Uh, the public so far has shown very little appetite for a tracking device on their car, even though you can track a lot of cars right now through people and their cell phones. And that's why, at least at this snapshot in time, it seems to be that we're going to see states charging more for the title and registration of an electric car rather than putting some tracking device on it to track how many miles they've driven. But it could go that way at some point in the future. Bruno Tata says, Porsche resale is great. $2,000 a month reduces that advantage. Few mainstream Porsches cost that much to own outright. No, you're right, Bruno. Good point. Again, 
Porsche isn't doing this because they're trying to uh, offer up a gift to the consumer. They're trying to figure out a way to make more money. And for people of high income, paying $2,000 a month or even $3,500 a month, which is what the top end of this uh, subscription service range costs, they will pay for that convenience of being able to get into whatever Porsche they want whenever they want to. And that's what this is about, is charging people for that convenience. Uh, Bruno says, I want a hybrid uh, versus an EV. What about long road trips? Well, you know, look, we're starting to see EVs that have longer and longer range to them. In a couple of years' time, and I mean only a couple, it will not be uncommon to see electric cars that have a 400-mile range and probably be able to charge up 80% of that in a roughly a half hour or so. Now, for a lot of people waiting a half hour, that's way too long. They're not going to go for it, especially if they're on a road trip and they want to make time going across the country. Having to stop for a half hour each time may prove too long for them. But for a lot of people, that's going to be no problem whatsoever. And they kind of like the, the adventure of trying to plan out their trip very well to match their charging with high, uh, with, you know, level three fast chargers and maybe at a nice restaurant or a hotel or something along the ways. It's, you know, different horses for different courses. Not everyone's going to like it, but some people are going to find that uh, a 500 or 400 mile range in an EV is going to be just terrific for going across country. Frost says, I think the Kia Nero is uh, the first of the trend. You could be right on that. You know, I think they're talking, what about a 270 mile range with the, the Nero EV. But again, they're not necessarily getting it through increased efficiencies. They simply put in a slightly bigger battery, which is going to drive up the cost of the car too. Clay Morexi says, seems like a subscription service would be a potential value for people with poor credit that would otherwise be captive to high interest rates or money fractions uh, factors. Uh, you could be right, but my guess is people with poor credit ratings are going to have a hard time with subscription services too. Let's see how that plays out because this subscription service thing is just getting going. And so far it's been with brands at the top end of the market. So that's almost guaranteed to have people with pretty good credit ratings. Bruno Tata's back. They have spoken because gas is cheap. When it's at $7 a gallon, they'll crave them again, meaning hybrids and all that. And you're right, $7 a gallon would change people's buying behavior when it comes to cars. Frost says uh, they say, sell it as a CUV that gets 50 miles to the gallon, not as a hybrid. He's going back to the Kia uh, Miro. And I, that's been my uh, advice to the car companies. If you want to sell more hybrids, don't call them hybrids. Uh, and the reason I say that I, is I think in today's political climate where things are so divisive, if you go out and tell people you drive a hybrid, others are going to perceive that as making a political statement. And people don't want to go out and make political statements right now. The vast majority don't. And so not calling it hybrid, I think, is going to be the fastest way to sell more of them. Uh, NC says hybrid name is uh, being hid in the, the trucking markets already. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, NC. So add to that too, would you? Uh, claim, uh, Bruno Tata says uh, uh, millennials need to buy more used cars, maybe. Uh, Robert Berg says despite all, despite all the new hype, have, uh, oh, oh, despite all the hype, uh, EVs aren't necessarily going to see widespread adoption anytime in the near future. Do you think EVs are inevitable or will this just be a phase that we look back on one day? Um, I agree with you. I, I don't think there's an instant market for EVs. I've talked about how I think we're headed for a disaster in four years time in 2021 to 2022 when over 120 battery electric models are going to hit the showrooms. I think that's just a wave that's going to hit the market way too fast. Having said that, I believe it is inevitable. I believe the future is electric. I believe that in the 2030 and beyond time frame, 
electric cars will become quite popular. That's when the cost of them will get down to the point where automakers can really, truly make a profit on them. I think that's when we'll get the cost of the batteries down. I think we'll have the whole infrastructure countrywide built out at that point. So I see disaster in four years. I see a bright future once you go a decade or beyond after that. Where are we right now? Okay, uh, NC says, Waymo is using Carnation to clean them, right? Yeah, very interesting. Uh, so it, uh, AutoNation called up Waymo and said, hey, you've got all these autonomous cars running around in Phoenix, Arizona. We want to learn more about this. We may have to get into that business. We would love to maintain all your Waymo autonomous Chrysler Pacificas. And Waymo said, brilliant, let's do it. And that's what they're doing right now. And uh, AutoNation is learning a ton about how to maintain these cars. And what they've found so far is they need very little maintenance because these autonomous cars drive themselves exactly how the owner's manual wants you to drive a car. They don't slam on the brakes. They don't mash the accelerator. They don't go squealing around turns. And so what AutoNation has found so far is that autonomous vehicles actually require less maintenance than cars that are driven by human beings. At least that's what AutoNation has found. Uh, Lexus fan 100 backs and wow, the new Genesis has way too many uh, sedans, all uh, the G series, but no SUV. And yet people are going crazy over them. When do you think people will get over the perception of the brand and treat it like a Lex, a luxury brand like Lexus? Well, let's back up a minute. Genesis sales are not going well. In fact, let me reach over here. I, I think I actually have the numbers handy. Uh, I'll keep talking while I do this, but you're right. They're not selling very well because they need a whole lot more crossovers in their lineup. All they have is two sedans right now, but here I, I, I've got it. Uh, so far this year, sales of the Genesis brand, and they weren't much to speak of last year. So far this year, they're down 18%, 1-8%. That's not very good. So they desperately have got to get crossovers, small, medium, and large, into their lineup, ASAP. And of course, they're working on it. These guys aren't dumb. They know it's coming. But uh, they should not have launched with those passenger cars because they're already digging themselves into a hole. And now they got to climb out of it and try growing after that. Uh, NC says, why do we need tracking when they can just require the extra, the annual mileage be checked uh, to be taxed on it? Well, look, people can cheat on the odometers of their cars. Uh, it's They could even disconnect them and drive all over. And then when you go in to see how many miles they've driven. Uh, so just checking the mileage on the car is, is not a way to figure out how you should tax an electric car because there's too many ways that you could game the system. Steve Young says, will the current administration ease up on the CAFE standards? That's what they're saying, Steve. They say they're going to ease up. But what does that mean? You know, they've come out and said they're going to ease up, but they haven't said what they're going to do. Are they actually going to roll the standards back? Are they going to freeze them where they are or what? Uh, I wish we'd get this all cleared up so that we could know what's going forward. But my opinion, this is my editorial opinion, and I've said this a lot, don't back off on the standards. But instead of making them required for 2025, move it back to 2030. That extra five years would give the automotive industry another design cycle to hit those standards. It would give them enormous relief and yet would still get to the same standards. I, to me, it would be a win-win for everybody. Let's see, uh, Joey's cleaning lady is back. Do you legally have to call it a hybrid due to governmental regulations and tax implications? Nope, you don't have to call it a hybrid at all. Bill B says, uh, the car companies made the mistake of charging more for a hybrid than the customer could afford, could save in, in gasoline. Um, well, look, it costs three, to, to do a hybrid, a strong hybrid, like a, a Prius, you're adding $3,000 more in cost. You got to charge for it. And there's just, or unless you want to accept that you're going to lose money on the car. 
But in today's automotive industry, you can't go to the board of directors and say, hey, give me a billion dollars to invest in developing a new car. And they're going to go, great. How much are we going to make on that billion dollars? And you're going to say, oh, we're not going to make any money at all. We're going to lose money on it. And they're going to say, no way in hell are you going to get a billion dollars to invest and lose it. We're not doing that anymore. Those days are over. Clay Marexi is back saying, do you think it's possible if battery production fails to keep pace, maybe hydrogen will be the technology to surpass battery? Uh, Long term, yeah. Uh, I, I've said this, uh, I think, before on Ask Auto Line. Every single R&D person I talk to in the automotive industry globally, every single chief technology officer I've talked to in the U.S., in Europe, in China, in Japan, in Korea, they all believe that hydrogen is the future. So it's not here yet. It's not ready for prime time. But when all the R&D people tell you hydrogen's the answer, I got to believe that someday that's going to be the answer. Remog's back saying, now that backup cameras are standard in the U.S., can we tell the automaker's mar marketing department to stop mentioning the feature? It's like saying the car has airbags. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Uh, but as far as they, as long as they think there's an advantage in telling you, hey, this car's got a backup camera, uh, they'll do that. Look, I remember when the first front wheel drive cars came out in the market. And that's what they would put on the, on the Monroney on the sticker. Ooh, this car's got front wheel drive. So, you know, if they think it can help sell a car, they'll put it on the, Hey, th look, this car's got doors. They'll even do that. Dave Sanger says, how do you think China's relaxation of ownership rules will affect current and future joint ventures? Ooh, good question, Dan. Uh, immediately this opens the door for Tesla to start building cars in China. And, you know, Elon Musk has hinted that they're going to announce very soon where they're going to put their factory in China because the, the rules come off, I believe, this year for EV manufacturers. So I could see anybody who's a startup rushing into the Chinese market before that. China has suggested that it will relax the rules for the other automakers starting in 2022. A lot can happen between now and 2022. Let's see what really happens. And when they say relax the rules, what does that mean? Do they go away? Or if in start, instead of limiting foreign companies to 50%, can they now get 51%? Oh, a lot of vague stuff. We really don't know what's going on there yet. Uh, Robert Bergback saying, I drive a Ford Focus EV. I love that car, by the way. That I got used, smart way to do it. And it's been very cheap to own. The environmental benefit may be the subject of debate, but I'm surprised there's not more discussion of the economic benefits. Robert, you did it right. You went out and bought this car. I'll bet you got a killer price on it because the resale values of electric cars are terrible. And uh, I, I think you made a really smart move there. And yeah, you can debate the, uh, the uh, environmental benefits when it comes to recycling of the batteries, but uh I think you made a smart move. And for others like you who are willing to be electric vehicle pioneers, boy, there's some dirt cheap electric cars out there that are terrific cars. And uh, if you can live with the limited range, they're a great way to go. Uh, Ken Croteau says, John, how did you get started in this industry? <laughs> Look, I've been a car nut since I was probably eight years old. I took my first plant tour, the Ford Rouge plant, when I was six years old. Uh, the bug bit me at a very early age. Uh, I raced cars when I was in college. I did showroom stock sedan racing. It's the only thing that I could afford. When I got out of college, I said, okay, now what do I do? Uh, I knew I was a pretty good rider. I got good grades in school and all that. And when you take writing classes, the first thing they teach you is write about what you know. And I thought, well, you know, I, I know some things about cars. I, I want to work for a car magazine. You know, I, I wanted to work for one of the buff books. Ultimately, I did get a job at Road and Track. But uh, when I started learning more about the automotive industry, I thought that the industry is absolutely fascinating, maybe even more interesting interesting than the cars themselves. And though I'm still a hardcore car nut, uh, I no longer just describe myself as an automotive industry or, or as an automotive enthusiast, 
I describe myself as an enthusiast for the automotive industry. It's an important industry. Uh, Hip Tech says, if our infrastructure is falling apart with little being done to improve it, why does anyone think the increased strain of electric cars will do anything but ha hasten its collapse? Well, I don't think electric cars are going to change things one way or the other when it comes to infrastructure. In the United States, we simply have got to spend more money on our infrastructure. Most of this infrastructure was put in place in the 1950s and the 1960s, and now we've lived on that for a half a century. That generation built it, and they benefited from it. Now it's time for us to pick up the torch and get those plans in place for the next half century. I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox there on that one. Uh, Frost says, I sold my $45,000 uh, fully loaded Bolt EV for $22,000 after one year. Buy a used EV. Or, yeah, <laughs> thanks for that input. Man, you took a bath on that. Or lease them. You don't have to buy a used one. If you want to bring a new one, lease it. That means the leasing company has got to take care of whatever it's worth. But having said that, the lease prices are kind of high for this very reason. You know, it all comes down to the residual value of what the car is going to be re worth at the end of the lease. And uh, the less it's worth, the higher the lease price is going to be. Let's see. Uh, NC says, I would send you the link, but I can't here and there. Let's see. But can't. Uh, here and there and other hybrids being used by RAM and none of them use the word hybrid. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing. You're right. Uh, RAM and Jeep are going with mild 48 volt hybrids. They're not calling them hybrids. They're calling it e-torque because it does add a substantial amount of torque to the engine. Uh, it has some regenerative capabilities. So it's not a strong hybrid uh, like a Prius. It's, it's a mild hybrid. So it'll give you some acceleration and it will capture some of that braking energy to be used later. But you're right. They're not calling it that. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, we've been at this a little bit longer than I actually wanted to go. Uh, we did have that technical glitch. But uh, let us know. Leave the comments. Do you like uh, Ask AutoLine? And we'll take any suggestions that you have, too. Like I said, we're still experimenting with this. So far, the feeds feedback has been quite good. But we look forward to reading what your comments are. So McElroy signing out for Ask AutoLine.